In March 1944, our southern front is on the defensive, fiercely contesting the efforts of Russian troops to achieve a decisive breakthrough in a southerly direction, so as to eliminate the entire German front in the south. My squadron of Stukas is operating from the airfield at Rakhovka, 200 kilometers north of Odessa, supporting our army units. We are in the air from dawn to dusk. We do everything in our power to help our comrades on the ground, destroying tanks, attacking artillery, and Ketyushas. Our efforts culminate in success, and we manage to prevent a decisive breakthrough of the front. Moreover, the army, as a result of these victorious actions, is able to retreat in full order to new positions further west in a few weeks. One day, during this battle, we go on a reconnaissance to the northwest, along the Dniester. Here the river makes a bend. Romanian troops report large columns of red motorized and armored forces in the vicinity of Iampol. These reports seem simply unbelievable, because if they turn out to be true, it would mean that the Soviets broke through in the north at the same time as they launched their offensive in the south and went almost 200 kilometers deeper into Bessarabia. I fly to reconnoiter along with another aircraft. Unfortunately, these fears are confirmed. Strong Soviet groups of all kinds of weapons are accumulating in the area of Yampol, and what is more, they are building a large bridge here. One may not wonder why this operation has gone unnoticed all this time. There is nothing strange in it for us. We have encountered it too often during the campaign in Russia. Our eastern front is heavily stretched. Very often there are only patrols in the gaps between key points. As soon as this chain of outposts is broken through, the enemy launches an attack in the unprotected zone. Far behind the front line, he can only meet a platoon of cyclists or a convoy. The vast expanse of this country is the most valuable ally of the Russians. With inexhaustible human resources, the enemy can easily penetrate such a poorly defended vacuum. Although the situation in the neighborhood of Yampol is becoming threatening, we do not consider it absolutely hopeless, because this sector, representing the gateway to their country, has been entrusted to the Romanians. Therefore, during the briefing before the reconnaissance flight, I was told that there were Romanian covering divisions on the Dniester, and therefore I had to be cautious as to the outcome of any attack. From the air, it is difficult to distinguish between Romanians and Russians by the color of their uniforms alone. The strategic objective of the Soviet offensive is clear, to encircle our forces in the south and simultaneously strike through Iasi in the direction of the Ploiesti oil fields. Since the presence of my squadron is required every day in the Nikolaev area, we cannot initially make more than one or two sorties to this sector. We use the forward airfield at Kotovsk, south of Balta, for our operations. So this mission now takes us westwards. Our main objective is the concentration of troops in the vicinity of Yampol and the bridge that is being built here. After each attack, the Soviets immediately replace the damaged pontoons and complete the bridge even faster. They try to thwart our attacks with heavy anti-aircraft fire and fighters, but we never once allow them to drive us back until we have completed our mission. Our success is backed up by intercepted Russian radio messages. These consist mostly of complaints about their own fighters, Red Falcons, accusations of cowardice, and enumerations of losses in men, military equipment, and building materials. We can often listen to Russian radio telephone conversations between ground troops and Red Falcons. There is one officer in my squadron who knows Russian. He tunes the receiver to their wave and does simultaneous translation. The Russians often yell wildly over the radio telephone to interfere with our conversations. They use virtually the same frequency as we do. During flights, the Soviets often try to give us false targets. Of course, the new targets are deep inside German positions. The corrections are made in fluent German, but we quickly figure out this trickery, and immediately after receiving such false corrections, I descend to make sure that the intended target is really an enemy one. Often we hear the warning shout, Stop attacking. Our troops are in the target area. You don't even have to bet it's a Russian speaking. His last words are often drowned out by the rumble of bombs. 
We laugh when we hear ground control cursing the Russian fighters afterwards. Red Falcons, we will inform your commissar of your cowardice. Attack that Nazi scum. We have casualties again. We have long been aware of the low morale of the Red Fighters, only a few strike air regiments being exceptions to this rule. These casualty reports are valuable evidence of our success. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. A few days before 20 March 1944, because of the abominable weather with heavy rains, we stopped flying. We pilots say about this weather, even the sparrows prefer to walk. You can't fly. As long as this weather lasts, the Soviets can continue their offensive and force the Dnieper without any hindrance. Against this threat, it is impossible to organize a defense. Not a single company can be allocated from the Nikolaev area. There are no other reserves. In any case, we assume that our Romanian allies, out of a sense of self-preservation, will defend their country with fanatical fury and will be able to compensate for our numerical weakness. On 20 March, after seven sorties in the areas of Nikolaev and Balta, I fly with my squadron for the eighth time. This is our first mission in the last five days against the Yampol Bridge. The sky is bright blue, and it can be assumed almost certainly that after such a long break the defenses will be considerably strengthened by anti-aircraft and fighter protection. Since the airfield and the village of Rakovka itself are drowning in mud, our fighter squadron has relocated to Odessa, whose aerodrome has a concrete runway. Our Stukas, equipped with wide tires, are able to cope much better with the mud and fall through it to a lesser extent than the fighters. We agree on the phone to rendezvous at a certain time 45 kilometers from the target at an altitude of 5,000 meters, just above a conspicuous bend in the Dniester. But there are likely to be some difficulties in Odessa. There is no escort at the rendezvous point. The target is clearly marked, so we naturally decide to continue the flight. There are several new crews in my squadron. The quality of their training is not as high as it used to be. Really good pilots by then have long been at the front. Fuel for training flights is strictly rationed and is a certain number of lighters per person. I firmly believe that if I myself had been restricted to such a small quantity I could not have flown better than these young pilots. We are still 30 kilometers from our target when I warn enemy fighters. More than 20 Soviet La Fives are approaching us. Our load of bombs makes manoeuvring difficult. I fly defensive circles so that at any moment I can tail the fighters as they intend to shoot down my trailing aircraft. Despite the aerial combat, I am gradually getting closer to my target. I frustrate the individual Russians who try to shoot me down by coming in from the front with my mobile tactics. Then at the last moment I dive through the thick of them and start climbing up. If the young crews can hold out for the rest of today, they can learn a lot. Prepare to attack. Close formation. Attack. And I dive for the bridge. As I dive, I see the flashes of the anti-aircraft guns protecting the bridge. The shells screech past my plane. Henschel says that the sky is like covered with wool, which is what he calls the bursts of anti-aircraft shells. Our formation is losing its monolithic strength and falling apart, making us more vulnerable to fighter attack. I warn those waddling behind us. Hurry up and catch up. We're as scared as you are. Not a single swear word rolls off my tongue. I make a turn, and from a height of 300 meters, I see my bomb explode near the bridge. So the wind is blowing. Wind left. Correction left. A direct bomb hit from our third aircraft destroys the bridge. Circling round, I spot the anti-aircraft batteries and give the order to attack them. They're going to get it today. Henschel expresses his opinion. Unfortunately, the two new crews are a little behind during the dive. The lags cut them off. One of these aircraft is riddled with bullets and whizzes past me towards enemy territory. I try to catch up with him. But I can't leave the whole squadron to fend for itself because of him. I yell at him on the radio telephone. I berate him, but nothing helps. He is leaving, descending, towards the Russian bank of the Dniester. Behind him stretches a narrow strip of smoke. No doubt he could have stayed in the air for a few minutes longer, like the others, and would have reached our trenches. His nerves have given out, 
that idiot, fickle comments over the radio telephone. At this point I can't deal with the downed plane any longer, as I must try to hold together our battered formation and maneuver westwards, using defensive circles. Fifteen minutes later the Red Fighters withdraw, and we head towards our base in our normal formation. I order the 7th Squadron Commander to lead the formation home. Together with Lieutenant Fisher, who pilots the second staff plane, I turn around and go back at low altitude, over the Dniester. The river flows here between high steep banks. Ahead, in the direction of the bridge, I see Russian fighter planes patrolling at an altitude of 1 to 3 kilometers. But here, in the river valley, it is difficult to see me and, and besides, no one expects my return. As soon as I rise above the shrubbery that covers the banks, on the right, three or four kilometers away, I spot our plane. It has made an emergency landing in a field. The crew stands beside the machine, and as I fly past them at low altitude, begins to gesticulate furiously. If only you had paid attention to me earlier, this delicate aberration could have been avoided. I mutter to myself and turn around to determine if this field is suitable for landing. Yes, it's safe to land. I give myself a pep talk. That's fine then. Carry on. This will be the seventh crew I pull out from under the noses of the Russians. I command Fisher to stay in the air and distract the fighters in case they attack. After bombing the bridge, I know where the wind is coming from. Release the flaps, take off the throttle. I'll land in a heartbeat. But what happens? I miss, and I have to throttle up again, and come in again. This has never happened to me before, or is this a bad omen? You're very close to the target you just attacked, far behind the front line. Cordis. One more throttle down, flaps out, I land. And immediately I notice the ground is very soft. I don't even have to brake. My plane stops exactly in front of my two colleagues. It's a rookie crew, a sergeant and a sergeant major. Henschel raises the lantern and I show them signs to get in quickly. The engine roars. They climb into the cockpit with Henschel. Red falcons are circling overhead. They haven't spotted us yet. Henschel ready. Yeah. I give the throttle, apply the left brake, intending to taxi so that I take off in the same direction I came from. But my right wheel is stuck in the ground. The more I apply the throttle, the more my wheel sinks into the ground. My plane refuses to move off, probably because there is a lot of dirt packed between the fairing and the wheel. Henschel, get out and remove the fairing. Maybe then we'll be able to take off. The mount has broken off. The fairing stays in place. But even without it we wouldn't be able to take off. We are stuck in the mud. I pull the handle towards me, release it, and give reverse. Not the slightest hint that this will help. It might be possible to spar but that doesn't help either. Fisher flies over and asks on the radio telephone, should I land? After a second's thought, I tell myself that if he lands, he won't be able to take off either and reply, no, don't land. You have to fly home. I look round. There are willows running towards us in a crowd. They're already 300 meters away. Get out of the cockpit. Follow me. I shout, and here we are hurtling south as fast as we can. As we landed, I saw that we were about five kilometers from the Dniester. We would have to cross the river no matter what or we would be easy prey to the Reds pursuing us. Running is not so easy. I'm wearing high fur ounce and a fur line jacket. It's best to ignore the sweat. Nobody needs to be pushed. We are not going to end up in a Soviet prisoner of war camp. For dive bomber pilots, it is tantamount to certain death. We've been running like this for half an hour. Who should have seen it from the outside? The Ivans are a good kilometer behind us. Suddenly, we find ourselves on the edge of an almost sheer cliff, which is washed by the waters of the river. We run here and there, looking for a path to get down. But it's impossible. The Ivans are already on our heels. Then suddenly a childhood memory comes to my mind. When I was a boy, we used to climb down from the top of a tree, sliding down the branches and reaching the ground in one piece. Large thorny bushes grow in abundance on the rocky slope. 
One by one we slide down and land at the water's edge. Our hands and feet are scratched and our clothes have turned to rags. Henschel is terrified. He shouts, dive. Better to drown than be captured by the Russians. I resort to common sense. We're panting from running. A brief respite, and then we tear off our outer clothing. Breathing heavily, the Ivans meanwhile run up to the cliff. We are not easily seen. They run back and forth and can't figure out where we've gone. I'm sure they think we couldn't have jumped off the cliff. The Dniester is rushing, the snow is melting, and there is a lot of ice floating by. The river is about half a kilometer wide here, by eye, and the temperature is three or four degrees above freezing. The others are already in the water. I get rid of my umbrellas and fur jacket. I follow them, wearing only my shirt and trousers, my map under my shirt, my medals and compass in my trouser pocket. When I touch the water I say to myself, no way in hell, then I think of an alternative, and there I am floating. Moments pass, and I am paralyzed by the cold. I gulp for air with my mouth, I no longer feel like I'm floating. Concentrate, think about swimming, and keep the rhythm. The distant shore approaches almost imperceptibly. The others are swimming ahead. I think of Henschel. He passed his swim test with me when we were in the reserve unit in Graz, but if he gives his full effort today in these more difficult conditions, he could repeat the record time or perhaps come very close to it. In the middle of the river I find myself next to him, a few meters behind the gunner from the other plane. The sergeant is swimming far ahead. He seems to be an excellent swimmer. Gradually we become immune to sensation. We are saved by the instinct of self-preservation, bend or break. I'm surprised at the endurance of the others, since as a former athlete, I'm used to overexertion. My mind dives into memories. When I did the decathlon, I always ended up running a kilometer and a half after I strived to show everything I was capable of in the other nine exercises. This time the hard training is rewarding me a hundredfold. The surgeon climbs out of the water and falls ashore. A little later, the corporal and I reach the shore. Henschel has another hundred and fifty meters to swim. The other two lie motionless, frozen to the bone, the gunner mumbling something as if in a delirium. Poor chap. I sit on the shore and see Henschel trying to reach the shore. Another eighty meters. Suddenly he throws his hands up and shouts. I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. And plunges into the water. He immediately resurfaces, but then sinks again and never shows his face again. I jump into the water again, using up the last 10% of energy I hoped I had managed to conserve. I reach the spot where Henschel dived into the water. I can't dive because I have to take a deep breath to do so, but I can't get enough air because of the cold. After several failed attempts, I can barely make it to shore. If I had somehow caught hold of Henschel, I would probably have ended up with him at the bottom of the Dniester. He was very heavy, and such a strain would have been beyond anyone's strength. Here I lay on the shore with my arms spread out, weak, exhausted, and somewhere inside is a deep sorrow for my friend Henschel. We say a prayer for the repose of our comrade's soul. The map is soaked through, but I keep it all in my head. The devil knows how far behind the Russian lines we are. Or is there still a chance we'll run into the Romanians sooner or later? I'm checking our weapons. I have a 6.35 caliber revolver with six rounds. The surgeon has a 7.65 with a full magazine. The surgeon lost his revolver in the water and only has a broken Henschel knife. We march south, clutching our weapons in our hands. The faintly hilly terrain is familiar from flying. There are a few villages in the vicinity, and a railway runs west to east 35 kilometers south from west to east. I know only two stations on it, Balta and Floresti. Even if the Russians have penetrated this far, we can count on the fact that this railway line is still free of the enemy. The time is about three o'clock in the afternoon. The sun stands high. The first thing we do is enter a small valley surrounded by hills. We are stiff with cold. The corporal is still delirious. I resort to prudence. We must try to avoid any populated areas. 
Each of us gets a certain sector to watch. I'm starving. It suddenly dawns on me that I haven't eaten anything all day. We were making our eighth sortie, and there was no time to eat between missions. After returning from each mission, a report has to be written and sent to the team, and instructions for the next operation are already coming over the phone. Meanwhile, our aircraft are refueled, the gunners load ammunition, hang bombs, and we take off again. The crews may get some rest and even ingest something but I don't have to count on it. I guess we've been going for over an hour now. The sun is starting to set and our clothes are starting to gradually freeze. There's something up ahead, or am I wrong? No, there really is something up ahead. There are three figures moving in our direction against the background of sunshine, which makes it difficult to see details. They're already 300 meters away from us. These people, of course, have already spotted us. Perhaps they've taken up a position at the top of one of the hills. Tall blokes, Romanians, no doubt. I can get a better look at them now. Those on the right and left carry rifles over their shoulders. The one in the middle is armed with a round disc machine gun. It's a young bloke. The other two are in their forties, must be reservists. They are dressed in brown and green uniforms. Without making any hostile gestures, they come closer to us. I suddenly realize that we are now not wearing any uniforms, and so they cannot make out who we are. I hastily advise the corporal to put his revolver away and hide mine myself, just in case the Romanians get nervous and start shooting. The trio stops a meter in front of us and looks at us curiously. I begin to explain to our allies that we are Germans, made a forced landing, and ask them to help us with clothes and food adding that we would like to return to our unit as soon as possible. I repeat, we are German pilots, made a forced landing, but their faces turn grim, and at the same moment I see three muzzles pointed at my chest. The young chap instantly grasps my holster and pulls a revolver from there. They were standing with their backs to the sun. Now I could get a better look at them. The hammer and sickle means Russian. I'm not going to surrender for a second. I'm thinking only of escape. I have one chance in a hundred. There must be a good reward on my head in Russia, and if I am captured alive, the reward must be even greater. Blowing my brains out wouldn't be practical for them. I'm disarmed. I slowly turn my head to see which way the shore is. They guess my intention, and one of them shouts, Stop! I turn round, duck low and run like a madman, darting from side to side. Three shots ring out, followed by a long burst from a machine gun, a searing pain in my shoulder. That young guy hit me in the shoulder with a machine gun, the other two missed. I run like a hare, zigzagging up the hill, bullets whistling all around. The Ivans run after me, stop, fire, run, fire, run, fire, fire, run, fire, run. Only a moment ago, I thought I could only drag my feet, so stiff they are stiff from the cold, but now I am running like I have never run in my life. Blood trickles down my shoulder, and I make an effort to dispel the darkness in front of my eyes. I've already gained fifty meters on my pursuers, bullets whistling incessantly. My only thought is, only he who resigns himself to defeat perishes. The hill seems endless. I run towards the sun to make it harder for the Ivans to aim. My figure almost dissolves in the sunshine, and it's harder for them to hit me. I just learnt that lesson myself. Here I reach the ridge, but my strength is running out and in the hope of stretching it, some more I decide to stick to the top of the ridge. I can't take another descent and ascent, so I run sideways along the ridge. I can't believe my eyes. From the neighboring hill, Another twenty or so evens are running towards me. Most likely they have seen everything and are about to round up their exhausted and wounded prey. My faith in God is shaken. Why did he initially allow me to believe in the possible success of my escape? I have just escaped from a completely hopeless situation, and would he hand me over to my enemies unarmed, stripped of my last weapon, my physical strength? My determination to flee suddenly receives a new impetus. I run swiftly down the hill. Behind me, 
200 or 300 meters away are my original pursuers, a new group coming up from the side. Only two are left of the first trio. For a moment they cannot see me because I am on the far side of the hill. One of them stays behind to lead my two mates, who had stayed put at the moment of my escape. The hounds on my left keep a parallel course. They want to cut me off. Here begins a plowed field. I stumble back and glance for a moment at the Ivans. I am deadly tired. I stumble over a clod of earth and lie where I fell. The end is not long in coming. I mutter another curse. I have no revolver, and so I don't even have a chance to deprive the Ivans of their triumph to take me prisoner. My eyes turn towards the Reds. They are already running across the same plowed field and must look carefully under their feet. They run another fifteen meters, then look back and look to the right, to where I lie. Here they are level with me. Here they go on. And after running forward another two hundred and fifty meters, they turn round in a line. They stop and look round, unable to work out where I've gone. I am lying on the slightly frozen ground and trying to burrow into the ground. The ground is very hard. The little clods of earth I manage to scrape up. I throw forward, gradually digging myself a foxhole. My wounds are bleeding. There is nothing to dress them with. I am lying flat on the icy ground in my wet clothes. My insides are on fire at the thought that at any moment I might be captured. Once again, the odds are a hundred to one that I'll be discovered and captured in less than a minute. But is that a reason to give up in an almost hopeless situation? when only the belief that the almost impossible can become possible can help. The Russians are now coming in my direction, shortening the distance between us, each of them searching a different section of the field, but not methodically. Some of them are looking in completely the wrong direction. They don't bother me. But here's one coming straight towards me. There's a terrible tension. Before he reaches me twenty paces away, he stops. Is he looking at me? Yes or no? No doubt he's looking in my direction. Does he come closer? What is he waiting for? For a few minutes he hesitates for what seems to me like an eternity. Every now and, and then he turns his head to the right or left. In fact, he is looking somewhere far away in the field. I gain confidence momentarily, but then I see danger ripening right in front of me again and my hopes are dashed. Meanwhile, the silhouettes of my first pursuers appear on the ridge and now that so many hounds are on the trail, they no longer take their task seriously. Suddenly, behind my back, and slightly to the side, I hear the rumble of aeroplanes and look over my shoulder. Stukas from my squadron together, with a strong fighter escort, and two storks, are flying over the Dniester. That means that Lieutenant Fisher has already sounded the alarm, and they are looking for me to get me out of this mess. Up there, they don't even suspect that they are looking in the wrong direction, and after landing I have already traveled a dozen kilometers and ended up on this side of the river. At this distance there is no way I can attract their attention. I dare not even raise my little finger upwards. They make one circle after another at different altitudes. Then they move off to the east and disappear, and many of them will be thinking, even he couldn't make it this time. They fly home. I watch them eagerly. You at least know you'll sleep in shelter tonight and stay alive. And I don't even know. How many more minutes of life do I have left? The sun is slowly setting. Why am I still undetected? A column of Ivans is moving down the hillside, in marching Indian formation, like Indians, with horses and dogs. Once again, I doubt God's justice, for it will not be long before darkness protects me. I feel the ground shake with their footsteps. My nerves are strained to the limit. I furtively glance back. People and animals are walking a hundred meters away from me. Why didn't the dogs smell me? Why can't anyone detect me? As they pass me, they scatter in a chain at two meter intervals. If they had done it fifty meters earlier, they would have walked right down my back. They disappear into the slowly thickening twilight. The evening sky turns a deep blue with faintly twinkling stars. My compass does not glow in the darkness, but there is still enough light for me to discern its readings I must keep heading south. On this side of the sky, I see a prominent and easily discernible star 
and another smaller one nearby. I decide to make them my landmarks. I wonder what constellation it is. It gets completely dark, and I can't see anyone else. I get up, stiff and hungry, my whole body aching and thirsty. I remember my chocolate, but I left it in my fur jacket on the bank of the Dniester, avoiding roads, paths, and villages, because Ivan must have posted sentries everywhere. I walk straight ahead, guided by the stars, up the hill and down into the valley, wading through streams, crossing marshy lowlands and fields where the corn was removed in autumn. My bare feet are cut to shreds. Again and again I bruise myself on large rocks. Gradually my feet stop feeling anything. The will to life and freedom make me hold on. They are inseparable. Life without freedom is only a shell. How far has Ivan penetrated our positions? How long do I have to travel? If I hear a dog barking, I avoid the place, as the surrounding farms are most likely occupied by enemies. On the horizon I often see gun flashes and a deafening rumble. Apparently ours have started shelling. But this means that the Russian breakthrough is over. At the bottom of the ravines that here and there cut through the hills I often stumble in the dark and fall into the ditches where there is knee-deep sticky mud. It sucks me in, and I have no more strength to free myself. I grab the edge of the ditch with my hands and pull my torso out of the water, but my feet are still in the sludge, and so I lie there, exhausted, feeling as if my batteries have run out. After lying like this for five minutes I gradually recharge and accumulate enough strength to climb up the steep walls of the ditch. But this unpleasantness is repeated without any pity again and again, at least where the ground is uneven. And so it goes on until 9 p.m. Well, that's it, I've had enough. Even after a long rest I cannot recover my strength. Without water, food and sleep I can't continue. I decide to look for some detached house. I hear a dog barking in the distance and walk towards the sound. I am probably quite close to the village. A little while later I come across a lonely farmhouse and struggle to quiet the barking dog. I don't like this barking at all. I'm afraid it will attract the attention of some picket in the neighboring village. I knock on the door, but no one opens it. Probably no one is there. The same thing happens again at the second farm. I go to the third. When no one answers this time either, I lose patience and open the window to climb inside. At that moment, the door is opened by a fearful man with a smoking oil lamp. I'm already halfway through the window, but now I climb out again and put my foot in the door. The old woman tries to shove me away. I walk past her resolutely. Turning round I point in the direction of the village and ask, Bolshevisti. She nods affirmatively. From this I deduce that Ivan has occupied the village. The dim light of a lamp faintly illuminates the room. A table, a bench, an ancient sideboard. In the corner, a grey-bearded old man snores on a rather crooked bed. He must be in his seventies. In silence, I cross the room and lie down next to him on the wooden couch. What can I say? I don't know Russian. The women will realize now that I'm not going to do them any harm. I am barefoot, the rags of my shirt sticky with clotted blood. I look more like stalked game than a nocturnal burglar. I lie down. A lamp flickers dimly above our heads. It doesn't occur to me to ask them to bandage my shoulder or my cut legs. I only want to rest. I am hungry and thirsty again. I sit on the bed and fold my palms in a pleading gesture, at the same time gesturing that I am thirsty and hungry. After hesitating for a moment, she brings me a jug of water and a piece of moldy cornbread. Never in my life have I eaten anything more delicious. With each sip and piece of bread I feel a surge of energy, as if the will to live and act has returned to me. At first I eat greedily, but after eating a little, I begin to reflect on my situation and work out a plan of action for the next few hours. I have drunk and eaten. I rest until one o'clock in the morning. It is now half past ten in the evening. Need to rest. So I lie down again on the wooden planks with the old men, half asleep, half awake. I wake up every fifteen minutes like clockwork and check the time. Whatever happens I can't waste the saving darkness on sleep. 
I have to make my way as far south as possible. 9.45, 10 o'clock, 10.15 and so on, 12.45, 1 o'clock, time to pack. I sneak outside. The old woman closes the door behind me. I stumble and fall down the steps. Is it my sleep or is it the dark night's fault? Or maybe the steps are slippery. It's raining. I can't see anything at arm's length. The stars are gone. Which way do I go? Then I remember that when I walked the night before, the wind was at my back. If I want to make my way south, I need to move into the wind. Or has it changed? I am still among the buildings on the farm. Here I am protected from the wind. The wind blows one way and then the other. I'm afraid I'll be traveling in circles. Inky darkness. Obstacles. I bump into something and bruise my shin. The dogs bark with glee. The houses are still around somewhere. It's the countryside. I can only pray that the next minute I don't run into a Russian sentry. Finally I find myself in the open and put my back to the wind with confidence. I am also rid of the mongrels. I ramble on as before, up the hill, down the slope, up, down, cornfields, rocks, woods, in which it is most difficult to keep my direction, for among the trees the wind almost dies out. On the horizon I see the incessant flashes of the guns and hear their measured booms. They help me to keep my course. Shortly after 3 a.m. I see a vague glimmer of light on my left. Dawn is near. A good check. Now I am sure that the wind has not changed direction and I am heading in the right direction. I've already covered 10 kilometers. I think I covered 15 to 18 kilometers yesterday, so now I am 25 kilometers from the Dniester. A hill about 200 meters high rises in front of me. I climb it. Perhaps from the top I will see something and be able to identify some landmarks. It's already light, but I can't spot any special places. To my left and right a few kilometers away, I see three tiny villages. But I discover that my hill is actually the start of a ridge that runs north-south, so I was able to maintain my direction of travel. The slopes of the ridge are smooth and bare, so it would be easy to see if someone was walking towards me. From here it would be easy to spot any movement. The pursuers would have to climb upwards, and that would put them at a disadvantage. Who at this moment suspects my presence? I am happy, because although it is already daylight, I am sure that I can walk south for a few more kilometers. I would like to cover as much distance as possible today without delay. I estimate the length of the ridge to be about 10 kilometers, which is a lot. But is it really that much? Apart from anything else, I encourage myself. You've run 10 kilometers. How often? In 40 minutes. What you could do then in 40 minutes, you can do now in an hour. And the prize is your freedom. So imagine you're running a marathon. I must have been a suitable model for the mad artist when I made that marathon run along the top of the ridge. Waddling, in rags, barefoot, on bleeding feet, clutching my hand to my chest so that my wounded shoulder wouldn't hurt so much. You've got to do it. Think about running, and running, and keep running. Every now, and then I switch to a trot, and then, after another hundred meters, to a step. Then I start running again. I could make it in an hour. But now, unfortunately, I must descend from the heights that protected me. The road leads me down. A wide plain stretches out before me. A small gully goes in the same direction as the ridge. This is dangerous, because here I am more easily caught off guard. Besides, the time is already approaching seven o'clock in the morning and unpleasant encounters are more likely. Once again, my batteries are depleted. I must drink, eat, rest. I still haven't seen a single person. Take precautions, but what can I do? I am unarmed. I am hungry and thirsty. Prudence is certainly a virtue, but thirst and hunger are stronger. Need makes me careless. To the left ahead, two farms are visible on the horizon out of the morning haze. I must sneak inside. For a moment I stop at the barn door and peek round the corner. Inside is empty. There is nothing. No harness, no farm implements, no living thing. But no. From one corner to the other, 
A rat runs from one corner to the other. There is a large heap of corn rotting in the current. I search it greedily. If only I could find a cob or two, or even a few kernels. But I find nothing. I search again and again. Nothing. Suddenly, I hear something crunching behind me. Several figures quietly creep past the entrance to another shed. Who are they? Russians or refugees, hungry like me and hoping to reach their own? Or are they robbers on the prowl for prey? I search the other farm. I scrutinize all the piles. Nothing. Frustrated, I decide that if there is no food, I can at least use these piles to rest. I make myself a shelter in a pile of corn leaves and am just getting ready to lie down when I hear a new noise, a cart rumbling along the road, a man in a high fur hat sitting on it, a girl behind him. If there is a girl, then there is no danger, so I approach them. Judging by the black fur hat, this is a Romanian peasant. I ask the girl, do you have any food? If you eat this. She pulls a few stale flatbreads out of the sack. The peasant stops his horse. Only then does it dawn on me that I asked a question in German and received an answer also in German. How do you know German? The girl tells me that she made her way with the German soldiers from Dnipropetrovsk and learned the language. Now she wants to stay with the Romanian peasants sitting next to her. They are fleeing from the Russians. But you're going straight in their direction. I can see in their faces that they don't believe me. Are the Russians already in that town? No. It's Floresti. This unexpected answer is reassuring. The town must be on the Balta Floresti Railway, which I know. Could you tell me if there are any German soldiers in the neighborhood? No. The Germans are gone, but there may be Romanian soldiers here. Thank you and Godspeed. I wave my hand as the wagon moves off. I'm sure I'll be asked later why I didn't requisition the van. The idea had never occurred to me. Aren't these two just as much refugees as I am? And shouldn't I be thanking God that I've been able to escape danger so far? After my excitement subsided, for a moment I was overcome with incredible weakness. All the last ten kilometers I had been in terrible pain. Suddenly it returned to my injured legs, my shoulder breaking with every step. I meet a crowd of refugees with wheelbarrows carrying the few belongings they had managed to salvage. They are rushing about in a terrible panic. On the outskirts of Floresti, two soldiers stand on the edge of a sandpit. German uniforms, a few more maters and my hopes are confirmed. An unforgettable sight. I call out to them. Come here. They shout to me from above. What does that mean? Come here. Who are you, mate? I'm Major Rudel. Yeah, no major looks like that. I don't have any papers with me, but in my pocket is the knight's cross with oak leaves and swords. I take it out of my pocket and show it to them. After looking at it, the corporal says, Well, we believe you then. Is there a German commandant's office here? No, only the headquarters of the field hospital. That's where I have to go. They flank me and lead me. I hobble rather than walk. The doctor cuts my shirt and trousers with scissors, the rags stuck to my body. He smears iodine on the wounds on my legs and bandages my shoulder. During this procedure I greedily choke on the most delicious sausage of my life. I ask them to let them take me to the aerodrome in Balta. Here I hope to find a plane that will take me to the squadron. What kind of clothes should I give you? The doctor asks me. All my clothes are cut to shreds. We have nothing. They wrap me naked in a blanket and take me by car to Balta. But what is it? The car door is opened by Lieutenant Eberspach, the engineer of the 3rd Squadron. Lieutenant Eberspach, commander of the advanced group of the 3rd Squadron. We are flying to Iasi. He is accompanied by a soldier who carries clothes for me. It turns out that my traveling naked from Floresti had already been reported to Balta by telephone and Eberspach was in the control room when this message was received. He was informed that his colleague, who had gone missing, would be arriving shortly in a newborn suit. I climb into a U-52 and fly to Rakovka, where my squadron is stationed. The phone rings, the news spreads everywhere like wildfire, and regimental cook Runkel has already started baking a birthday cake. 
The squadron is built. I look into the smiling faces. I feel reborn. As if a miracle has happened. Life is coming back to me. And this reunion with my comrades in arms is the best reward for the hardest distance of my life. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. We mourn the loss of Henschel, our best gunner, who flew 1,200 combat missions. This evening, we're all sitting around the campfire together. There's a festive atmosphere. The group has sent delegates, among them a doctor who was supposed to sit at the headboard of my bed. He sends me the general's congratulations, together with orders that I am not to fly and will be immediately sent on leave as soon as I am sufficiently recovered. Again, I have to disappoint our poor general, for I am more concerned with the question whether we can now hold the Soviets, who, having forced the Dniester, are tearing southwards in large forces. I cannot spend a single day in bed. Next morning we have to move to Ayasi. It's bad weather. We can't fly. If there are no flights, I can obey the doctor's orders and rest. The next day I fly with my squadron to Ayasi, from where it is closer to make combat sorties across the Dniester. My shoulder is bandaged and I can't move my arm, but it doesn't interfere too much with flying. Worse, my legs are shredded to the bone, and I can't walk. Any pressure on the pedals causes unbearable pain. I am carried to the plane in my arms. Ayasi is a pretty Romanian town, so far completely intact. It's a great view for us, it reminds us of home. We gawk in shop windows and cheer like children. The next morning our reconnaissance detects strong enemy armored and motorized forces north of Balta. They are probably already entering the town. At first the weather is bad, the terrain is mountainous, and the highest peaks are shrouded in fog. The situation is sad. There are no more troops to hold the front. The enemy's motorized infantry could be here in a few hours. Who will stop them? We're alone. Intelligence reports heavy fire from anti-aircraft guns, which the advancing Reds have brought with them. Soviet Lafives and Aerokovers are constantly circling over these armored wedges. Our entire southern front in Russia and the crucial oil fields in Romania are threatened. I am deaf and blind to all advice based on my physical condition. The Soviets must be stopped and their tanks, the striking force of the army, must be destroyed. It will be weeks before our colleagues on the ground manage to establish a line of defense. My gunner, non-commissioned officer Rothman, carries me in his arms to the plane. Six sorties to exhaustion in the morning, then three in the afternoon. The weather is terrible. Heavy anti-aircraft fire. After almost every sortie, I have to change aircraft because of damage caused by anti-aircraft guns. I feel very ill. Only the determination to stop the Soviets wherever I would meet them keeps me strong. Besides, it was these soldiers who tried to take me prisoner, and on the day I escaped, Moscow Radio had already reported that they had captured Major Rudel himself. They probably didn't believe that I was able to reach my colleagues. Did my colleagues who couldn't escape with me give up my name? Using bombs and cannons we attack tanks, columns of trucks with patrol and food, infantry, and cavalry. We strike from an altitude of 10 to 200 meters because the weather is nasty. Together with other aircraft equipped with 37 mm guns, I go on a tank hunt at extremely low altitude. Soon the other crews are left on the ground, because when my aircraft is damaged, I have to use another one, and so on until there are no more serviceable anti-tank vehicles left at all. If it takes too long to refuel a whole squadron, I order fuel to be quickly poured into my aircraft, and together with another pilot, we make extra flights between general sorties. Usually our fighters are not in the air. The Russians are using all their numerical advantage against us alone. During these air battles I find it difficult to maneuver as I can't push the pedals. I only use one control stick. But so far I have only taken damage from anti-aircraft fire, albeit during every sortie, which is quite often. During the last combat sortie that day, I fly an ordinary Stuka with bombs, and two guns of two-inch caliber. With these weapons, it is impossible to penetrate even medium-thick tank armor. Presumably, the Reds do not expect us to appear so late. 
Our only purpose is to establish their places of concentration and to get a general idea of the situation, which is of the utmost importance for tomorrow. We fly along the two roads that run north towards Balta. The sun is already setting. Huge clouds of smoke are rising over the village of Felesti on the left ahead. Perhaps there are still Romanian troops there. I fall behind the squadron and fly over the village. I am met by heavy anti-aircraft fire. I see a mass of tanks, followed by a large column of lorries and motorized infantry. Curiously, the tanks have two or three spare fuel tanks. It is as if a flash illuminates me. They are no longer expecting our appearance and want to break through tonight into the heart of Romania, in the area of oil fields, and thus cut off our entire southern front. They take advantage of dusk and darkness, because during the day they cannot move when my stukas are circling over their heads. That's why the tanks have extra tanks, it means they can break through even without their trucks. It's a major operation, and they've already started it. I can see it quite clearly now. We're the only ones who know what's going on, so the responsibility is ours. I'm giving the order over the radio telephone. This attack is of the utmost importance. Bombs to be dropped one by one. Attack at low altitude until we run out of ammunition. The gunners will also fire on the vehicles. I drop the bombs and start hunting the tanks with my 20 mm guns. At other times it would be a pure waste of effort to fire on tanks with weapons of this caliber, but today the Ivans are carrying tanks of fuel, and here they miscalculated. After the first bombs, the Russian column stops and then, under cover of ferocious anti-aircraft fire, tries to move on, maintaining formation. But we don't let ourselves be intimidated. Only now they realize that we are serious. In panic, they scatter away from the road, turn into the fields and circle incessantly performing every defensive maneuver known to them. Every time I fire, I hit the tank with a burst or incendiary shell. Apparently the fuel leaks through the gaps. Some of the tanks that stand in the shadow of the hill explode with blinding flashes. If their ammunition explodes, the sky is redrawn with a veritable fireworks display, and if the tank is carrying a certain number of flares, they shower the whole place with an unimaginable array of colors. Every time I go in for an attack, I am conscious of the responsibility that lies upon us and hope that we will succeed. How fortunate we are to have spotted this column today. I am running out of ammunition. I have already destroyed five tanks, but there are still several monsters in the field, some of them still moving. I still have to pay them back somehow. Hadalor 7 is the call sign of the commander of the 7th unit. Come home after you've used up all your ammunition. I'm flying at top speed to the airfield with my wingmen. We are not waiting for refueling. We have enough fuel for a new flight. We only need ammunition. Twilight is fast approaching. Everything is going too slowly, though our gunners are working hard. I have already explained to them what is at stake, and now they are doing their best not to let down their comrades in the air. Ten minutes later I take off again. On the way we meet the returning squadron. It is already approaching the aerodrome with the landing lights on. An eternity seems to pass before I find myself over the target. Even from a distance I can see burning tanks and lorries. The explosions illuminate the battlefield with an ominous light. Visibility is very poor. I head north and flying at a low altitude over the road I come upon two steel monsters traveling in the same direction, probably with the intention of breaking the sad news to the rear. I make a turn and charge in. I can only distinguish them at the very last second. When I'm flying low, it's not easy to hit them. But they, like their predecessors, have spare fuel tanks, and I manage to blow them both up, even though I have to use up all my ammunition. Together with these two, a total of 17 tanks are destroyed during the day. My squadron destroyed about the same number. So the Ivans have lost at least 30 tanks today. It's a black day for them. Today, after all the events, nothing will disturb our sleep in Ayasi. Of that we can be sure. We will find out tomorrow how far the offensive has advanced. We sit down in complete darkness. Gradually, as the tension subsides, I begin to feel pain. 
Both the army and the group command want to know all the details. Half the night I hold the telephone receiver next to my ear. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Today's mission is quite predictable. To attack the same enemy forces as yesterday. We leave very early to be over the target as soon as dawn breaks, as we can be sure that Ivan has made good use of the respite. The weather is still inclement, and the height of the lower cloud edge is 100 to 120 meters. Once again, Stupeter is helping the enemy. Surrounding hills are poorly recognizable. We can only fly along the valleys. I wonder what's in store for us today. We're passing Felesti. There's nothing but rubble, everything. Just like we left yesterday. South of Balta we meet the first tank and motorized infantry columns. We are greeted by anti-aircraft guns and fighter planes. Everyone must know by now what a performance we gave here yesterday. I should be extra careful today and under no circumstances make a forced landing anywhere near here. We attack without delay. During every sortie we engage in aerial combat without any escort, as there are hardly any of our fighters in this sector. Besides, we have trouble with the weather. We have to fly very low all the time, and there are no losses, but we have to ignore it because we are dealing with an emergency situation, and it is in our own interest not to stop attacking for a minute. If we don't get in the air, it won't be long before the Iwan take over our aerodrome. It is a pity that Henschel is not with me during these difficult sorties. With his experience as a gunner, he could make my life much easier. My gunner today is non-commissioned officer Rothman. He's a good bloke, but he's a bit inexperienced. We all like to fly with him because we say, even if no one comes back, you can bet Rothman will make it somehow. After our return from the first mission, I lament the delay and go on an intermediate flight accompanied by Fisher. We are attacking tanks on the outskirts of Balta. Above the target we have to rendezvous with several fighters. We fly as low as possible. The weather has become even worse. Visibility is less than 800 meters. As we fly higher above the city, I look for fighters. And there they are, but not ours, but the Russians. Look, Fisher, it's only arrow covers. Keep up. Come closer. They've already spotted us. About twenty of them. Only two of us. Easy prey. They're attacking us with confidence. We can't gain altitude. We have to fly over the ground, using every ravine to get lost. I am unable to maneuver because I can't push the pedals. I can only change course slightly with one control stick. This tactic doesn't save me for long especially if I'm being followed by a fighter whose pilot knows at least the basics of his craft. But the one following me now knows his craft perfectly. Rothman is starting to get nervous. They're going to shoot us down. I yell for him to shut up and shoot instead of wasting his breath. He keeps shouting. Shells are going into the fuselage. Rat-a-tat-tat-tat. Hit after hit. I can't use the pedals. I'm overcome with blind rage. I'm out of my mind with rage. I can hear the rumble of large caliber shells. In addition to the 20 mm cannons, the Aero Cobra is firing 30 mm shells at me. How long will my trusty U-87 hold out? How long will it be before the aircraft is engulfed in flames or falls to pieces? I was shot down 30 times during the war, but always by anti-aircraft and never by fighters. Each time I used the pedals and maneuvered with them. This is the first and last time a fighter hit my plane. Rothman, fire. He doesn't answer. His last words, shit. The machine guns jammed. Now I have no defense behind me. The Ivans are not slow to take advantage of this. They become even more aggressive than before and come at me from behind. Right, left. One mate attacks me from the front time after time. I take cover in the narrowest ravine I can squeeze into with great difficulty, barely missing the walls with my wings. They're firing quite accurately, taking hit after hit. The chances of getting home are slim, but not far from our airfield in Iasi, they give up the pursuit, probably out of ammunition. I lost Fisher. He was flying sideways and behind all the time, and I lost sight of him. Rothman doesn't know what happened to him either. 
Did he go into a forced landing or crash? I don't know. The loss of this able young officer hits the squadron with particular force. My aircraft is riddled with 20 mm shells and hit by eight shells from a 37 mm gun. Rothman couldn't protect me for too long. Anyone would be knocked out after such an adventure, but there's nothing to be done about it. I climb into another plane and fly again. The tips have to stop. On this day, I take out nine tanks. A difficult day. During the last sorties, I have to strain my eyesight to find at least one tank. That's a good sign. I assume that at this point, the enemy offensive is exhausted, and infantry without armor will not be able to break through too far. The next morning, reconnaissance confirms my assumptions. Everything is quiet, almost extinct. After I land after the first sortie of the day, a young mechanic jumps on the wing of my aircraft, gesticulating fervently, and congratulates me on my award of diamonds to the Knight's Cross. A phone call has just been received from the Fuhrer's headquarters, but the message also contains a flight ban. The guy's individual words are drowned in the hum of the engines running, but I understand the meaning of what he's telling me. In order not to see the text of the message, I do not go to the control room, but stay by my aircraft until preparations for the next flight are completed. At noon, the general calls me to Odessa by telephone. Meanwhile, congratulatory telegrams are coming in from everywhere, even from members of the government. There is an uphill struggle ahead to get permission to fly. The thought of my comrades preparing for a new flight and me having to follow to Odessa upsets me. I feel like some kind of leper. This addition to the award makes me despondent and nullifies all the pleasure of knowing that my achievements have received such high recognition. In Odessa I learn nothing new, only what I already know and what I would like to hear about. I absent-mindedly listen to the congratulations. My thoughts are with my fighting comrades who can care about nothing and keep flying. I envy them. I must proceed immediately to the Fuhrer's headquarters to be personally awarded the diamonds. After a stopover in Tiraspol, we transfer to a U-87. If only Henschel had been with me, now Rothman is sitting behind me. We fly the route Fokshini Bucharest Belgrade Kekskmet Vienna Salzburg. It's not often that a head of state receives an officer reporting in his undies, but I'm glad I can walk around in them, even in constant pain. Oberst von Belov comes to Salzburg to accompany me, while Rothman goes to his home by train. We agree that I will pick him up in Silesia on the way back. For two days, I sunbathe on the terrace of the hotel in Berchtesgaden, breathing in the delightful mountain air. Gradually, I relax. Two days later, I find myself in the company of the Fuhrer in the magnificent Berghof. He knows my whole story down to the smallest detail and expresses his joy that fate has been so favorable to me and we have been able to achieve so much. I am impressed by his warmth and caring heart. He says that I have done enough, so he orders me to stay on the ground. He explains that there is no need for all the great soldiers to give their lives. Their example and their experience should be preserved for new generations. I reply by refusing to accept the award. If having received it, I will no longer be able to lead my squadron into battle. He frowns, a brief pause follows. Then a smile appears on his face. Very well, in that case you can fly. I am happy at last and anticipate seeing the look of pleasure on the faces of my mates when they hear I have returned. We drink tea together and talk for an hour or two. We discuss new weapons, the strategic situation, history. He explains to me specifically that there have been recent tests of the FA weapons. At present, he says, it would be a mistake to overestimate its effectiveness because the accuracy of the new weapon is still very low. But he adds, this is not so important because there is hope of producing missiles that will be absolutely reliable. Later we will be able to rely not on ordinary explosives, but on something else so powerful that when we use it, the war will end immediately. He tells me that his development is already very far advanced and completion can be expected very soon. This is a completely new twist for me, and I can't imagine it. Later I learn that the explosive effect of these new missiles will be based on atomic energy. 
After every visit to the Fuhrer, I receive a lasting impression. From Salzburg, I fly to Gorlitz, my hometown. The reception given in my honor tires me more than some combat sorties. When I finally get to my bed at seven o'clock in the morning, a chorus of girls serenades me. My wife has to convince me for a long time to come out and wish them good morning. It is very difficult to explain to people that despite being awarded diamonds, I would not like to participate in celebrations and receptions. I only want to have a holiday. I spend a few days with my parents in a close family circle. I listen to the news from the East on the radio and think about the soldiers fighting there. Finally, nothing holds me anymore and I can go back. I call Rothman in Zita, and our U-87 takes us south again, through Vienna and Bucharest to the Eastern Front.